Great. Welcome to our next session. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Michael Free, uh, who's uh, an AI research manager at BT's Applied Research Department. A lot of his work has been focusing on business applications of deep learning. So uh, this is about machine learning processes, looking at natural language, uh, as well as customer interaction data and image recognition and such. This is about models that cheat, making it really work. This ought to be really a, a really fascinating discussion. So Michael, over to you. Thank you. Uh, when people talk about AI or neural networks or things like that, it can often evoke uh, images of like mental cognition or personification. Uh, and models that cheat, um, you might, you might think, oh, is this, this is the AI model doing something nefarious to fool, fool its users. Uh, but no. Actually, machine learning models do exactly what you tell them to uh, with, with somewhat ruthless efficiency. So if we, if we take this example here, uh, let's say you're trying to build an image classifier uh, to classify you know, cats, dogs, different types of animals. So you have your training data. Uh, you have uh, your model, which I've somewhat provocatively labeled as a black box here. And then your model will make some predictions. Uh, and in a supervised learning case, so where you know you have some example data, you have the answers that you're comparing it to. Uh, and what all the model is doing is trying to minimize how wrong it is. So this uh, loss here. And there's many different ways of computing that. Uh, you could use different, different functions. It could be as simple as you know, the literal difference between the model predictions and the labels, you know, something like mean squared error. Uh, and in this task of minimizing that loss, you might not be solving the underlying problem. And, that, and that's where this concept of, of cheating comes in. The model might be finding some other efficient way to solve this problem. Uh, and we'll go through a few examples of, of where that's happened, uh, some pretty high profile cases. Uh, and then you know, what, what are some defenses against this? So to, to sort of illuminate the point, we have an example of, of uh, a classifier that's built to, to uh, tell between wolves and huskies. Uh, and so you know, look, look pretty similar. So uh, humans probably re relatively able to tell them apart. But you've, uh, if you build a machine learning model, it turns out it can be really accurate. right? So you get, get really good results. But a lot of wolves are found in snow. And a lot of huskies tend to be found not in snow, in people's gardens, for instance. And so it turns out what the classifier is doing under the hood is just learning to detect snow in the image and saying that's a, that's a wolf. And if there's not snow, then it's husky. It's not actually learning any of your underlying problems at all. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to this example uh, later. So the, these things can have uh, real consequences when working, working with data. So here was some work done by a group of researchers uh, to build an image recognition model to be able to detect the uh, prevalence of pneumonia uh, by using uh, medical scans of a, of a patient. And it turns out, initially, the model did really well on the data set that they had. And as they dug a bit deeper and deployed it uh, out to hospital, tested it with other hospitals' data, they found the performance dropped drastically. Uh, OK, hang on, hang on, what's going on? Now, it turns out they had some data from a few different hospitals. And some of these. Uh, would use uh, portable scanners that they would take out to their patients. And it turns out in, in the x-rays, there's a little metal token uh, that exists that you can see in the x-ray that they put on the patients when they, use it, when they use a portable scanner. Now, it turns out that you use a portable scanner when your patients are really ill. And so all the model was doing here, or one of the things it was using heavily in, in predicting whether uh, the scan was of a, of a person with pneumonia or not, was looking for the the little metal token in the image, because the, that was only with the portable scanner, and the portable scanner was only used on the sick patients. And so by using this to alter the sort of distribution for the two different groups, the portable scanners and not, it could make uh, accurate predictions, but it's not actually looking for any signs of pneumonia in the image itself. So it's, it's cheating the results. Here we have a, another example. So BERT's question answering. So BERT is a, is a language embedding model. Uh, we want, we'd use it to basically turn our text into uh, a set of numerical values that we can use then for, for machine learning, because we can't put the raw text into, into the machine learning models, because uh, computers are good with numbers, not, not so much with, with language. Uh, now, once we have this foundational you know, words as, as numbers, we can train small models on top to do a variety of different tasks. One of the tasks that's popular with this, with this sort of technique is question answering. So we have a question and then a passage of text. 
And the idea is the model is trying to extract extractive question answering, extract the, uh, the answer from the passage of text, find the start and the stop token. Now, what would we like the model to do? Uh, well, if you look at the example on the, on the left, so when did the Scholastic Journal come out? We want it to use some logic. Uh, so come out, you know, that's, we want it to link to the, the passage in the article which says begun, the Scholastic Journal, we'd want to uh, have, a, have a set of two links, so the Scholastic Magazine and the one, to the one-page journal, and then there's the date and the line, and that's the, that's the answer. Uh, now, it turns out what these models sometimes actually do is just use a shortcut. There's the word when in the question, and there's only one date in the passage of text we've given it. And so it just says, OK, the date must be, must be the answer. So it's not actually learnt any of the logic about how to answer questions. It's just using very basic principles. And some research has proved this by uh, creating, essentially, questions that could be shortcut and a very similar question that was a more challenging version. So by paraphrasing the question, so changing the words in the question, so those exact words couldn't be found in the text, um, and having some examples that had additional references. So in the example on the right, we have you know, who was raised the most powerful female musician, uh, and uh, the passage of text is about Beyonce, uh, and then there's uh, another artist in the, in the text references as, as Lisa. So in, in the shortcut version, that's not present, and when these models are tested uh, on, these te on, on the, short, the, the versions that can be shortcut and the challenging versions, the models perform far better on the, short, the versions that can be shortcut, uh, indicating that uh, a large part of what the models learned is essentially how to shortcut to the answer and not the underlying logic about how to, how to answer these questions. Another example uh, we have uh, looking at uh, converting aerial photography to street maps and then back again. Uh, so this was uh, a piece of research that was, that was done and you can see the researchers found that there were lots of features in the reconstructed aerial photography that aren't at all in the generated street map. So the idea is that the street map is a bottleneck of information, uh, essentially. So the, the aerial photography is being transformed to the street map, and then purely from the street map, it's reconstructing re uh, the aerial photography. And little things like skylights on buildings were appearing in the reconstruction and things like that. And so, which wouldn't be possible because the, that information shouldn't exist in the generated map. Turns out, turns out, if you use some methods to essentially turn up the contrast, uh, you can, the researchers found that the model was storing high-frequency data uh, in the generated street map. So you can see, see on the bottom of the slide uh, some examples there where small color variations were being used to encode information in the reconstruction, uh, which makes perfect sense from the objective the model was trained to, but doesn't solve the task of regenerating aerial photography from the street maps, because in, with actual street map examples, we wouldn't have the model having encoded you know, high frequency color variations to store information that it would later need. Here's an example, uh, you may have heard of it, or some research done at Facebook looking at um, negotiating agents. So this is two natural language um, agents that were negotiating uh, with each other uh, about a set of items. So each agent would have different values they'd place on books and balls and things like that. Uh, and the idea was each agent wanted to maximize the value it could get out of the transaction. So you know, can, we, can we use AI to build negotiating agents? And it was widely reported in the media that you know, the models had invented their own language and it had to be shut down. Uh, this not quite the case. So uh, again, you have your machine learning model and there's some intermediary thing, which is the conversation. And then there's the goal that you're actually training it to, which is to end up with the most items or the most value in items at the end to each agent. But what the researchers are actually interested in is this intermediary bit in the conversation. But that's not the objective the model's being trained to. And also wasn't constrained to have coherent sentences and things like that. So due to some of the reward functions in the, in the model, the agents essentially devolved, as you can see, uh, into using uh, shorthand to represent the items or repetition of words uh, that, that the agents themselves would understand, uh, but isn't intelligible English, English to an outside uh, observer, uh, to uh, efficiently communicate uh, the desires, because the, one of the incentives the model was trained to was to negotiate quickly, to have shorter conversations. Uh, and this led to really good agents at negotiating with each other, but, but not a usable result. So again, uh, an example of cheating. And so I guess, what can we do about this? So if 
often we have to train to some objective function that isn't exactly what we want because we don't have the, the, a way of working out the, uh, or targeting the underlying problem. We can just say, we want you to get this problem correct, not we want you to identify the dog in this image. Well, we can, we can use some checks. So first, we want to make sure we've carefully considered our data sets. So by this, I mean, does your data set cover the domain of the, uh, the whole domain of what, what you want your machine learning model to apply to? Uh, so this is, this is an, uh, a good example. So this picture here is from something called ObjectNet, which is where a collection of images alongside ImageNet, which is a huge database of different sorts of uh, you know, dogs, cats, household items, ObjectNet is targeted at getting these items in unusual scenarios. So you can't just use the background information to classify uh, what the item is, right? So, so can, we, can we actually uh, get the machine learning model to identify the item rather than just the where it's found? Uh, and using uh, similar principles, uh, essentially making sure that your data covers all the different scenarios you'd want your model to apply in, uh, we can uh, help avoid this, this, uh, this model cheating. Uh, because it would mean that we can identify these problems in, in when we test the model before we deploy it. Uh, and just quickly, you can see the huge performance drops. The red lines at the bottom are the performance on object net versus classical uh, image recognition tasks uh, from uh, baseline models. We can use interpretability techniques to try and understand what the model's doing. So back to the Husky example, uh, on, on the... Uh, on the slide here, you can see an example of uh, something called Lime, which is a local interpretable model agnostic explanations. But essentially, we're trying to work out where in the image is the model looking uh, to be able to make its predictions. Uh, and you can see, using this sort of technique, we can identify, ah, it's just looking at the snow in the background. So our model hasn't learned the underlying things. So maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and uh, have another look at our data, uh, as Detlef explained earlier. And there's a similar example on the right here uh, to do with, with text. Uh, the text domain, and working out how the model sees the link between words. And finally, we can make sure that we're keeping track of how our models are performing in life. So can we uh, have a look at what our expected performance is on the data and how it's performing when we expose it to real-world scenarios and keep monitoring that to make sure that there are no problems creeping in that might indicate that there was some model cheating in the, in the building phase. And also uh, making sure that we understand the providence of our models. So what data was it trained on and when and to what purpose was it trained? So some of these examples of model cheating you might be perfectly okay with because you might have a very constrained domain that you want to apply your model to. However, uh, that, that information should be propagated along with the model so that people that might pick up the model and use it for other tasks understand exactly the reason it was trained. Uh, and using these sort of techniques, uh, hopefully we can uh, avoid uh, model cheating creeping into the models that we build. Uh, and if you fall foul of this, th this sort of problem, you won't be the first and certainly won't be the last. If you look yourselves, there's a listening of these sorts of examples, examples that you can find. Thank you very much. <laughs>